Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for the opportunity that you give us to just feast upon your word. What a privilege it is just to hold your word and to study it, to meditate on it. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. And we've been studying together in the first epistle of John, verse by verse. And we're in the third chapter. Uh, we're uh, moving, moving along quite uh, rapidly through the, the third chapter. I guess that, or I guess that would depend upon your perspective. Uh, we, I don't know if we're about halfway through the epistle or, or what, but it's, I want to say a few things before we start. Uh, I have never been, uh, or tried to be, or wanted to be, uh, critical of people, uh, but I am critical and I often am critical of erroneous theology. And my ministry is mostly polemical. It has been since the beginning. And I don't think that that's an exception. I think that's really more the norm. I believe the more that we look into the truth of this book and uh, we discover the truth of this of what God has said in this book in his word I believe that our ministry will be out of necessity mostly polemical because that's just the the times that we're living I want you folks to consider the amazing grace in what we have seen as we studied through this marvelous epistle I mean, I, I really need you to just really meditate on just how wonderful and how amazing God's grace is. Because we talk about God's grace and, we, and Christians tend to, to use that word loosely. Folks, we're seeing some amazing grace here in it's almost, in my estimation, at least in my understanding, it's almost in, impossible uh, to describe. It goes beyond the normal thought concerning grace. It is just grace upon grace upon grace. And of course, I understand also that the argument, you know, against what I teach as, as a a believer who believes in a, a God-only gospel, monergism, not synergism, uh, that we're not under law but we're under grace. The the objection, uh, you know, usually is is something along the lines of 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 that which concerns responsibility. The argument concerns the question of responsibility or accountability. Okay, if we're under grace, then uh, you know, if God has done so much, if He's done so many wonderful things where does that leave us as far as responsibility uh, goes and i just believe that the argument uh, uh, that concerns the question of responsibility that the, the 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 actual discussion has to center on the question of where that responsibility lies i mean does it lie with the old man or with the new man I mean, it's, we're talking really about two different things. If we're talking about responsibility as in the sense of our uh, walking according to the flesh, you know, we can look at responsibility from that perspective, or we can look at it from the, uh, the perspective of us walking according to the Spirit. That's, that's one thing that I think needs pointed out. And uh, 
does it does it lie within the old man or the new man and of course you know what my answer is to that and and as far as i'm concerned there is no in between there's two families there's two seeds okay there's uh this uh, the seed you know of christ and there's the seed of of the the wicked one satan there's two families the family of god and the family of satan and I think that as we've gone down through this, I think the Holy Spirit has done a a, uh, a an astounding job of separating the two. I think much of the the problem that many Christians come have when they come and approach uh, these verses in First John, not just First John, Second John, Third John, and in fact many other epistles. I think one of the hang-ups, one of the problems that Christians have is is they, and especially when it comes to First John, they'll come to this epistle and they they will miss completely miss seeing the amazing grace of God that is in this chapter. Uh, what many feel when they go through first john especially chapter three is a burden when what we're seeing is the grace of god expressed toward his people in a in a marvelous marvelous way but they don't see that and and so they read these verses and they feel uh a burden uh, because they don't they the 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 idea is, is that they, they just don't see themselves as much as they'd like to. Uh, they see a lot of what we're reading here as, as a responsibility, something that we have to accomplish. Okay, if, you know, God is going to do something that we need, then we need to do something. It's, there's a lot of conditions read into these texts that just clearly are not there. There are clearly two families spoken of in these passages and the common approach is to view all these things as uh, conditions whereby we merit God's favor okay and we've seen a lot you know what the idea being that if we believe you know if we receive if if we love the brethren if we are forgiven if we abide in him, if we keep his commandments, if we overcome, if we're righteous, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, we, we'll, we'll go to heaven. But if, if we're not, well, then we won't. And I'm convinced that that's how many, 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 many of your Christian friends read through these passages. And folks, the text says nothing anywhere close to that. This is the first epistle of the Apostle John. And dearly beloved, we should be awestruck by what the God of all grace is saying to us here in these passages. Behold, keep in mind, it started out... Behold, what manner of love. You know, that we would be called the children of God. And of all the other religions in the world, you only see this, this love in Christianity. Love, it's a love that only Christianity knows. No other religion. Uh, 212 uh, your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake and if that's all there was folks that would be astounding enough okay that's all our sins past present future just as colossians we we saw in colossians all our sins are forgiven all of our trespasses not just the ones that we committed in the past and that alone, just that one truth alone, 
is phenomenal, but it goes on. Christ is the propitiation we've seen for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And without rehashing all of that, we're, we looked at that before where we know that the reason that he's the propitiation for the sins of, of, of the whole world is because the father's demand for justice had to be satisfied through the death of Christ. It doesn't mean that Christ died in the place of the non-elect. If, if you have Christ dying in the place of the non-elect, then we have a real problem because we have Christ, we have the, a double jeopardy uh, sort of thing going on. You have Christ paying for those sins as well as the non-elect paying for those sins. And, and we can't have that. They were made alive in Christ. All were made alive in Christ. It was later that as Paul says in Romans 7, that we died in our own sin. When the law came in, sin revived, and we died. But all, all were made righteous in Christ. Uh, we guard His commandments. We keep. I, I pointed out the word there is guard. We guard His commandments. That's There's a big difference in saying that we do uh, the law of Moses and we guard the commandments of Christ. Big difference. Okay, We're not under law. We're under grace. It's not, uh, we don't do the commandments of Christ. We're not under law. We guard His commandments. And we've, we've seen what those commandments are. Uh, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Our text has, has shown us that we will abide in Him. We will remain in Him. We will continue in Him. There is no question about that. And the only reason that we will is because we are His children. We were born by God from above. And so we will remain in Him. Now let's, let's think for a moment. Let's, let's suppose we just stopped right here. Okay, isn't, I mean, what more do you want? But it, but it goes on and it gets better. You know, we've overcome the wicked one. Well, how have we overcome the wicked one? We've overcome the wicked one in the sense that the new creation, born of God, uh, that cannot sin, it w because we've been made the righteousness of God in him, uh, that we stand before God without spot, without wrinkle. That we stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. The new, the new man, the sinless new man, that cannot be touched by evil. Uh, there had to be a new creation, a new man, a sinless new man, in which in which Christ could take up residence, reside. Uh, he could, Christ could never have come and resided within us just as a, a, a single-natured individual in the flesh. He could not be touched by sin, and therefore we have overcome the wicked one uh, solely because of what Christ did. This is not something that we're called to do. We're not called to overcome the wicked one. If, if somehow we could just somehow overcome the wicked one and, you know, we'll make it to heaven. If somehow we can uh, continue, if we'll just continue to remain in him, uh, we'll go to heaven. Well, if we guard his commandments, we'll go to heaven. You know, if he's forgiven us of all our sins, we'll go to heaven. If we don't go overboard and sin too much and out sin his grace, we'll go to heaven. And it's so it matters, folks, how we approach the text from the outset, you know, right from the beginning, you know, where are we going to stand in relationship to these verses as as who we are and, and who we are, are we are uh, God's children. We've seen a marvelous, 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 marvelous truth, and that is that the new man cannot sin. 
in verse nine. Uh, it, I pointed out every good how that Jesus st stated himself stated every good tree brings forth good fruit. Every bad tree brings forth bad fruit. You know, a good tree can't bring forth bad fruit. A bad tree can't bring forth good fruit. That's just th those are those are our Lord's own words. Matthew chapter seven. Uh, just like uh, fresh water and salt water, you can't. And, uh, and I've had, I've heard people say, "Well, you know, Steve, you can mix fresh water and salt water, and you can have both." No, you can't. You know, you mix salt water with fresh water, and guess what you had? Salt water. The text has clearly shown us that we love the brother and. Uh, we love one another. The, the word there in the Greek, another, it's one of the same kind. Okay? Uh, I think that's worth pointing out. We love the brother. We love those like us. Nowhere in this book were we ever commanded to love everybody. And, and uh, the general thought, the idea today is, well, that God loves everybody. That is clearly not the not uh, true we clearly see from scripture that that is not simply not the case jacob i loved esau i hated but we love the brother we know from john chapter 10 that only his sheep hear and believe it's not that if we hear and if we believe we'll be his sheep okay uh, we've spent some time talking about that. You know, it's uh, for someone to say, well, I believe in the total depravity of man, Steve, but we still have to accept Jesus Christ to be saved. Well, then you really don't believe man is totally depraved. Uh, we've seen in the, in the 13th verse that the world hates us. And we, we've seen why the world hates us, and it's because God chose us. You'd think that, well, it hates us because of the things that we do or the things that we say. or No, no. The reason the world hates us is because God chose us. And I, I spent some time talking about the world as in the world religious system, which I believe fits the context. If you go back to John 16, it's, it's the world that would put us to death thinking... They were doing God a service. The world hates us. We see that in John chapter 15. We see that here in, in chapter 3. And it hates us because God chose us. You go into, into any church service, any Bible study, anywhere. You've got, you go into, you sit down to have a Bible study. There's 40 people in the room. And you, and you start talking about uh, uh well, just, just start in uh, to the, uh, the first verse, I suppose, of, of Philippians or Colossians. Paul, an apostle by the will of God, and right away, okay, it's, it was, it's by the will of God, okay? Apostle was, uh, uh, or Paul was an apostle by the will of God, not by the will of Paul. And, and when you begin on that basis, uh, you might, you might, if you're in a room full of 40 people, you might have 36 people walk out, and you might have four people left, left there in the room. Uh, Christians have this automatic; uh, you're just automatically repulsed by any idea that 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 God cho chose us. It just makes more sense from a human perspective that we chose God, and it doesn't seem fair that not all people are able to choose God. It ought to be an equal opportunity salvation. And, of course, that's not what the book teaches, and we have to point that out, and as a result of that, the world hates us. He didn't choose me because I was smart. I was intelligent. He didn't choose me because I was handsome. You know, my wife did, but, you know, but God didn't choose me because I was anything uh, f for any other reason except that I was his child. And of course, 
The same was true of Noah. I pointed out Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah's only thought was evil continually. One of, the, one of the grand repetitive themes in the Word of God is that we have not chosen Christ, but He's chosen us, born again by the will of God. That's John 1.13. Not by any synergism on our part. And that truth, folks, is known as monergism. And, it, and it's virtually died out among much of modern Christianity today. But the testimony of Scripture is clear. That it is God who has redeemed us absolutely apart from any synergism on our part. That is such a dynamic truth in my life that it, it changed forever my perspective on, on God and the Christian life. We are His. We belong to Him. We're not His, folks, because we walked across a room. Okay? Where he, we are His because of the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of, of God. Okay, John 1, 13, born again by the will of God. If you don't believe that, folks, if you don't believe that, then we are worlds apart. Uh, in verse 25, we know that He abides in us by the Spirit which He has given us. That's how we know. Not by experiences, not by, you know, what others have told us, what others have tried to convince us, how, uh, for any other external, uh, I don't know what you'd call external, or even internal reasoning, no human logic, no human reasoning, you know, well, I've, I've, I've done such and such or so and so, and therefore, as a, you know, because of that, okay, uh, uh, I know that Christ abides in me because of the things I've done. And that's, of course, that's not what the text says. We know that he abides in us by the spirit which he has given us. We uh, looked at Cain. Cain's works was evil. Abel's was righteous. And, and I tried to point out how important it was that we not we not look at uh, at, at at these two individuals uh, apart from Christ. It's you can't. It's not that we old oh, man. We just want to be like Abel. You know, if only we could be like Abel. If only our deeds could be righteous like Abel's. And 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 we've got to be careful and not allow our deeds to be uh, evil like Cain's. You know, and, and God has, has shown us evil and, uh, and, and good and evil here. He's shown us Cain and, and Abel here. And we have a choice. Now Now we have a choice to, to either live like Cain or live like Abel. Or, or be like Cain or, or be like Abel. And that's not, that's not the lesson there. The lesson is, is that Cain's works was evil. He could do no righteousness. Abel's was righteous. Uh, the word uh, argos there in the Greek, the er argos, the work, the word work there is not, is associated with Cain. His works was evil, but Abel's was righteous. You don't see the word works, but it's, I believe it's implied. I've had some people tell me, well, you know, it's interesting that the word works is associated with Cain, but you don't see the word works associated with with Abel, it just it's just saying that Abel was righteous, but that the the but uh, when you look at that, you Greek students, if you look at that sentence structure in the original text, you'll see that it's it's it does include that Abel is being included in that statement. It's basically saying Cain's works was evil and Abel's works was righteous. Now, why was that? It was because Christ died in his place. Christ died in Abel's place. That's the only reason that Abel's was righteous. And in, of course, back in, in the last chapter, the verse 29, if you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone that do, doeth righteousness is born of him. 
We were made righteous in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Verse 7 of chapter 3 here. The seventh verse. The Holy Spirit of God said in, in Romans chapter 7, verse 20, It is not I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. And how many of us can, can say that? Well, every single born-again child of God has a right to say that. That it is not I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. It's, it's not you. It stems from an entirely different creature. That was created in righteousness and true holiness that cannot sin. But the problem today is we look at the Christian as a single natured individual in which he can well he can either you know do do evil or he can do good and if he and if his somehow his good uh, someday outweighs the bad then he'll make it and so we're, we're this is really this is a proving ground that we're living in here it's a a place of testing where that our 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 faith is tested, uh, it's it's we're sort of on probation if if you, if you know what I mean. Here it's it's our our life, our our relationship, our walk with the Lord is one of probation. Okay. And dearly beloved, that is not Christianity. And I think many of us understand that. He that doeth righteousness is righteous you know from the time you wake up in the morning until the time you your pill your head hits the pillow at, that night you have not only do you have a right a, 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 the privilege okay but i believe you have the responsibility the accountability the res, the responsibility to to live in light of the truth that you are righteous because of what Christ did. It's, it's an obligation. If, if you want to talk about, you know, oh, Steve, you know, all this grace stuff, grace this, grace that, God's done this, God's done that, you never talk about what we ought to do. I, folks, I, I think I have. I believe that our accountability, our responsibility to God is, is one which is related to, it has to be related to the truth of his word and what he said, what, what he has said is true of us, of him and us, of what he's done in our lives. We are accountable to the God of all grace, dearly beloved. It, we're not accountable to, to some other pagan god that is uh, off that's different from the god of christianity i pointed out right at the beginning here that christianity is is unlike any other religion and i and i put those that word in quotes on earth there's never been anything like christianity and yet christianity today in the main lives pretty much for the most part they, they live little different, little different than most other religions that don't know this love of God that we're talking about. The word is absolutely crystal clear. There are two seeds and we are of God. We're the children of promise, Galatians 4, 28. Okay, children of promise. That's in contrast to Cain, who is of the wicked one. Okay, keep in mind, Cain was the first child ever born into the world who was a child of Satan. I mean, 
Try to wrap your mind around that for a moment, just a moment. The first child ever born into this world was a child of the devil. And the text says, we know, and that, that's oida, that's a perfect, perfect knowledge, perfect tense. It's not, a, it's not an experiential knowledge. We know, oida, perfect tense. We are confident. And then again, you see, you see another perfect tense. We are, we, we are confident that we have perfect tense passed from the death to the life. It's, it's articulated, okay? The death passed from the death to the life. It, it may read, we passed from death to life, okay? But it's, it's articulated in the Greek. And, and we've done that because, why? We love the brother. We intellectually know, oida. And I'm, I'm glad that it's not gnosko, experiential knowledge. It doesn't say that if you love the brethren, you will pass from death unto life. It doesn't say that. You know, it doesn't say that we ought to love the brethren. It says that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me already has everlasting life. And if, and if you don't believe that, read on. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's John 5, 24. Same author, Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 24. That's why they hear. That's why they believe. And that's why they love. What verse 14 says to me is what Jesus Christ did in your life results in your new man loving the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in the death. It's Again, it's articulated. And, and I believe that those articles there, they show, uh, they were put there by God, the Holy Spirit. To show specific identity. You know, we can fake a lot of stuff, folks, but we can't fake love. And the word there is, is agapao. It's, it's agape love. Verse uh, 15, whosoever. And, and, and I, hate, you know, I hate that. I've always hated that word, whosoever. I know Arminians love it. The word there is pos in the Greek. It's all. Uh, but let me read it the way it's, it's generally uh, read. Whosoever who, hate, who hate, hateth his brother is a murderer. Okay? Whosoever who hateth his brother is a murderer. Okay, so the, it, it tends to, the word whosoever tends to convey the wrong idea. It's a lot different if we read it just as it's, it's, as it's uh, written in the original text. All, the word is simply all. It's, it, would, it makes a whole lot of difference when we read, read it like, like this, and we say, all who hates his brother is a murderer. Okay? And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. All right? The old man hates. The old man's a murderer. You know, well, what about David? You know, how about Paul? I mean, he was on the road to Damascus killing Christians. Oh, uh, well, they repented, Steve, so, you know, we can, uh, you know, we can kill somebody and then all we got to do is repent. We got it made, right? It was not the new man in David or the new man in Paul that murdered. You know, I... I don't want this to be confusing, folks. Look, can we murder as, as new creations in Christ Jesus? Absolutely, we can. Absolutely. Is that of the new man? No, it's not. It's of the old man. The old man hates and is a murderer. What God created in Christ, a new man that is holy 
and righteous cannot commit murder. And murder is a characteristic of the devil's children, which was proven in the life of Cain, and uh, as well as his father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. And no other religion, and I still, I got to put that in quotes, puts as high a value on life as does Christianity. The verse does not say one of God's children hates another one of God's children, and yet that's what a lot of people do with that verse. I do not believe that God, folks, I do not believe that God is whitewashing the old man. He's made you a new creation that is created in righteousness and true holiness. And you have to decide. And, and time's running out, okay, for us all. You have to decide. Was Christ Jesus' work on your behalf, was it sufficient? Okay? Or was that just part of a process that you have to finish? I can tell you that there is not a single verse in all the in all of Scripture that says that we have to sanctify ourselves. First Thessalonians 5, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your entire spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you who also will do it. Philippians 1, 6 being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it, will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And if you turn over to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, marvelous, marvelous verse, for both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one. What a fabulous truth. Verse 16, hereby perceive we the love of God. It is now, that's, that is, now we're looking at, this is not Oida, this is Gnosko. Experientially perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. That word there in the, in the Greek for, he laid down his life for us. That word is huper, is literally can be translated in the place of. That's, that's which denotes a substitutionary sacrifice, which is exactly consistent with all of Scripture on this, on this subject. In our place, substitutionary sacrifice. We hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brother. I've, I've thought a lot about this verse. I, I'll just, just to be, just to, state it as simply as I can. I, I believe that the new creation, that that's exactly what the new creation would do. Our new creations would lay down our lives for the brother. Now, having said that, I, I also believe that that we are also we were told to walk as Christ himself walked in, in in chapter 2 verse 6 he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked you know the question there in my mind concerns well, what does it mean to lay down our lives for the brethren okay we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren well, well does does that necessarily have to mean you know martyrdom I don't. I wouldn't discount martyrdom. I wouldn't say that that is not included in the verse. But what I would, what I would suggest for your thinking here is that it goes far beyond that. Okay, our life. We're not laying down our the end of our life for our brother. We're not laying down a death for our brother. We're we're laying down our life for our brother. And 
we have the greatest example, and that is Christ. But we're not under law. It is, uh, there's something very dynamic that takes place in the Christian life apart from law. Where that there is no law, where there's no law, there's no transgression. I know that I am totally inadequate to, 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 to put into my own words what I think God has done concerning us, His people, those who are in Christ, the grace that He's shown, the extent of that amazing grace, which and that love which is endless, which knows no bounds. Just the idea that God would conform us to the image of His Son by grace, just that just thinking on that astounds me because uh, we would normally think, and this is the world that we grew up and we, you know, into and we, we've lived, you know, we've lived under a system, a world system that is primarily, as, you, as far as it goes universally, I mean, we are, we are judged based upon our performance. And yet that's not true in the Christian life. Uh, we, we live under a system in, in which if we don't work, we don't get paid. That uh, reward is based on labor. And that we, you know, the, the whole idea is, is that, you know, we can be good people or bad people. And it's the good people that succeed. It's the bad people who don't. And then you have Christianity coming in. You have Christ coming in and changing all of that. Turning it all upside down. You know, we're the, the off-scouring of the world system. We're, the, we're despised. We're rejected. We're, we're, uh, we're unknown, yet well-known. It's, you know, the, the, the least will be the greatest. It's, you know, you can see how the Lord is has taken and just flipped it all on its head. And, and rather than us believe that we live the Christian life, that the Christian life is really the Christian. Well, what is the Christian life? Well, it's the Christian, you know. No, it's, it's Christ. We've seen that in, 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 our, in the very study that we're, that we're doing. For me to live is Christ. Your life, folks, is not yours. You were bought with a price, a very precious price. You were bought, purchased back because you previously, you, you, you never were apart from him. He, God always loved you. You were always his child. And he bought you back. You've returned unto the shepherd of, of your soul. And just like the prodigal son. You know, it was in a far country. And, and he returned. He returned. He left a son. He returned a son. He never, there never was a time where he wasn't his father's son. I, I'm of the mind that if we spent just a few minutes out of every day one of our days just sitting around thinking just meditating spend some time in meditation and prayer and in a little study just trying to wrap our minds around the the song that we sing you know amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me but then but then we sing that, but then we go away thinking, you know, we just, you know, basically we've just thrown every single one of the words to that song. We've, we've thrown, we've thrown it away. Is, is grace really, a, 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 is it, is it what the song says? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Is it sweet? Is it sweet music to our ears? 
Or is it something that we feel we have to argue with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ over? That saved a wretch like me. You know, Paul said, O oh, wretched man I am, who shall deliver me from the body of the sin and death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I love you all, I truly do, and I I have no expectations of any of you. I have no demands to place on any of you. I have no restrictions to place on any of you. I have no I don't even have any requests really per se. I mean, you know, that you will you know, I don't know where God has you in your life today and what he's doing specifically in your life at this very moment. And so, I, therefore, I have no right to tell you that you ought to be over here. Maybe God wants you over here. And maybe by telling you what I think you ought to do to clean up your life or to, to, to fix the problems in your life, that I'm, there's always the danger of me moving you away from that area in which God is working into an area in which He's not. Dearly beloved, we are not under law, but we are under grace. And that... that Amazing grace of God ought to soothe your soul like nothing ever did. I want to finish reading out the rest of this chapter and we'll come back and we'll talk about it in the next video. Verse 17, But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? And I want you to just think about that for a moment. We've seen how the, the, the Holy Spirit has contrasted the, child, the children of the devil with the children of God all the way through this. I don't think that he's, he's broken off from that. I believe that we're looking at uh, uh, a very unique situation here. We'll talk about that some more in, in, in my next video. Uh Notice that it says he shuts up his bowels of compassion from him. It doesn't say, well, he doesn't provide the need. Of course, uh, I think you could assume that he, that he doesn't provide the need. But zero compassion, okay? Zero compassion. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know... We know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Marvelous, marvelous verse. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we Keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of the Son, of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and hereby we know that he abides in us by the Spirit which he's given us. We're fastly approaching the end of 2021, and before you know it, we'll be in the spring of 2022. And 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 as you might can expect, I'm really looking forward to spring of 22. Folks, we're living in crazy, crazy times. I don't know how often you you keep up with the news with current world events or and all of that. But I just remember back in 2017 when, or 2018, early in 2018, and people would write me and say, Steve, I just don't see how things can go on and on to, to 2021. I mean, uh, and yet look at all that's happened. I have made it, purposely made it a point not to make this ministry, YouTube ministry channel political and and I remain steadfastly committed to that principle I will not go political with this channel 
other than to, to remind you of the fact that things are rapidly changing faster than we can keep track of them, of, of those things. And time is short for all of us, whether we're alive when the Lord returns or whether he is not, or whether we are not alive when he returns. Our lives are but a vapor. And we have one shot, folks, one shot at this. We have one opportunity, one lifetime to glorify God. We have one opportunity in this life to allow the truth of God's word to bring honor and glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I beseech you in the name of Christ to look into these things, to examine your heart, to examine what's written in light of what's written, and to take God at his word because he loves you so much that he just didn't just die for you. Make giving you the opportunity to decide whether or not you would somehow accept that love and that forgiveness, but that he died in your place. And as a result of that, you cannot die. If God has done so much for us in Christ, and he has, then how should we then live? That becomes that becomes the, the big question in, in all of our lives. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Uh, I'm sure I'll see you again before Thanksgiving. Until then, rest in him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.